the mainline church, the Christ. I mean, there are bright spots here and there, but overall, they've been in a period of decline for a long time. And honestly, so has the ICOC. Uh, so uh, I don't think I'm being mean about that, but uh, the critics who were then, those who love the church, uh, mention those things a lot. But there's a perception, and it's true. So while well, the mainline churches are getting smaller, more and more churches are being planted around the world. So we went to London in 82. Uh, Chicago wasn't technically a planting, but New York was in 83, then Toronto. And after that, it was all over South, uh, uh, South, Carolina, uh, South America and Asia and everywhere, and eventually with hundreds and hundreds of churches, um, you know, 600 or so. So the formal split happens, I think, in part because of the remnant doctrine. But when you're going to say, if you're not under our authority, we don't consider you Christians, that's, that's just not good. I, maybe I said it too strongly before. I just think that's wrong. Uh, that's too much like the Autrophies should be like Demetrius, refer to the third John. Anyway, you can uh, see the split, you can see what happens if you look through the various documents, and eventually uh, the Boston movement has changed uh, its uh, locus, its center of power, you could say, from Boston to Los Angeles. And uh, Kip moves from Boston to, Boston's a big town, a big city, but not like Los Angeles larger than many countries that I've visited before. And a new name is suggested by John Vaughn Fuller, uh, Theological Seminary. That name is? Uh, the International Churches of Christ. So what happens in like the, kind of the late 80s and then into the early 90s, the Churches of Christ would publish directories, right? Churches of Christ still publish directories to some degree, although it's... Like where the saints are Yeah, where the directories are not kept as easily or as well today. Um, but these would be published directories to know who, where all the Church of Christ are, how big they are, and so forth. At some point, they have to make a decision. Do we continue to include Boston movement churches in the Church of Christ directories? And uh, Lynn McMillan and other people who are involved in kind of the editing of these directories and, um, and then also the publications of various Church of Christ periodicals and so forth, at some point, between 87 and 88, depending on which directory and periodical you're looking at, make a decision to say, at this point we've really reached a stage in which Boston movement churches are not part of the greater you know, association of the Church of Christ. And so when these directories get published in the late 80s, early 90s, they no longer include Boston churches. That's what prompts John Vaughn at Fuller, who's a church growth expert, to actually contact International Church of Christ was Boston movement at the time, and to say, listen, how do you want me to list you? Do you want me to list you as part of the Churches of Christ or to list you as something else? They have to go back and forth a little bit on this, and he says, well, I don't know. I think we're saying this is Roger Lamb who's having a conversation with John Vaughn. He says, what do you, what would you call us? We're, we're not really the Churches of Christ. And John Vaughn comes back and says, well, you're really kind of the international Churches of Christ. You have a much more global focus in some ways. The, the leaders of the Boston movement at the time discussed that name and said, we like it. Print that. Go with that. Well, the alternative is Kip with Joe was a cult. You want to say a word on the assessment here and then we'll move on to the next? Yeah, I know. I'm so you know, when you look through it, you want you things that you, no, there are things that you, you want to say. You, you, Watch this happening before your eyes. Uh, but th th there were you know, the various brotherhood publications like Firm Foundation and Christian Chronicle, and, and they used to uh, list all the churches that had 100 baptisms a year or more. And at first, in the list, um, well, we weren't there at all, and then we'd appear. But after a few years, we were dominating the whole list. And that must have been discouraging uh, because we we're clearly talking past each other. Strengths, evangelism, no doubt that's a strength in the thousands of people being baptized. Just the energy. You could say the youth, although it wasn't just youth. It, was, it, it had moved beyond. Not that Crossroads was only youth. Crossroads had a lot of older people, too. But that was kind of the, uh, the breadbasket. Multiracial. I think in the Boston movement, it was easy. You, mean, you just reach out to everyone. You didn't ask racial questions. And so the international churches are really integrated. I mean, where I go, in Atlanta, we're probably 45 50% black, maybe 35 40% white, and then Asian. We're weak on Hispanic, only about 40 Hispanic members out of 1,000 plus. But and let me just say a word on that, because that is so distinct 
when compared to the churches of Christ. Or the um, Christian churches, which tend to be monochromatic. Yeah, right? the churches of Christ um, have struggled, considered, with integrating white churches and black churches. And this is something that almost from its beginning, the International Church of Christ, the Boston Movement, simply figured out and was quite good at. And that's a major strength, especially, I would say, now in the world that we live in where we're beginning to recognize how vitally important that is to the body of Christ and to what it is to be called the people of God, to have that kind of diversity and, and, and racial integration, and to have had the ICC focus on that so early, I think is a great strength. Which, if you're a member of the ICC, you're probably a bit blind to that. I mean, you know it, but you don't understand an expert on um, racial diversity, a 75-year-old man comes to church me a couple years ago, and he's just blown away. And I say, it's not just Sunday. We, we're with each other, and we, we even marry each other. Now, I'm not trying to say that there's, there's no racism in the ICOC. That would be uh, silly. But it's a great strength. Women's ministry, um, the international focus, uh, there aren't many strengths, but they're weaknesses. Some are inherited from the Crossways <laughs> movement. Personality cult, uh, this charismatic leadership model, which is not the best model if you want real time feedback and you want maturity. Um, sexual sin, resistance to criticism, which was called spiritual pornography. Don't read it, it's pornography. It's not really pornography, I think, unless it's about lewd photographs. <laughs> but it was a way of managing, of controlling, and increasing arrogance toward outsiders. You see, up until 87, we went to each other's conferences. When we planted the church in London, we cooperated with all the churches of Christ. We tried. I don't know how humble we were, but that didn't come to an end, <laughs> especially once it was proclaimed that if you're not with us, you're not Christians. One of the significant lacks at this point in the movement, and then as it continued as well, was a lack of deep, formal biblical education and training a lack of an awareness of church history, really in some ways a lack of an awareness of the churches of Christ and where this Boston movement or the International Church of Christ had come from and come out of. And so most of the people in the ICOC who had any kind of biblical degree or biblical training were people who had come out of the churches of Christ and had gotten that degree before the Boston movement kind of existed or as it was still crossroads transitioning into Boston. There came a point when that was no longer valued and no longer emphasized and no longer even encouraged. In fact, sometimes actively discouraged. Uh, there's the passage, of course, in Acts that talks about these ordinary and unschooled men. And that was emphasized considerably that you don't need biblical training in order to be a minister yeah. in the kingdom. Of course, the apostles only had three years of biblical training with Jesus. <laughs> uh, I can remember living in, in Boston at the end of my time in Boston, expressing to the leaders in my Boston campus ministry that I was interested in getting a theological degree, a biblical studies degree, and being discouraged even then in the early 2000s by an elder saying, for one, in one case, the Bible has already been translated. You don't need to learn Greek or things like that, which may just be a, a, an individual case, but I think, unfortunately, is largely representative of the whole in terms of the attitude towards biblical education and understanding, which I find to be, and this is I'm speaking for myself as I am for all of this, um, I find to be terribly sad because of how much potentially could have been avoided, how much damage had occurred potentially could have been avoided Amen. if people within the Boston movement had continued to seek training and understanding and awareness outside of the movement, if nothing else, in church history, so that they could know and not repeat many of the mistakes that would, could easily have been avoided, which ended up being repeated, not just in church history, but within the Crossroads movement to the, to the Boston movement. The Boston movement cut out the Crossroads movement from the story. And a common question I'm still asking around the world. Wait, you were baptized when? 1977. Well, how could you be a Christian? There was no church until 1979. That's when the church came back to the planet Earth. You know? <laughs> 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 um, okay, so, uh, 
So, uh, I'm going to use some terminology here, which is, which is a little bit strange. We're, we're going to talk about ICUC 1.0, and then ICUC 2.0, and then kind of 3.0, reverting back to 2.1. This language will make more sense in the second class. But what we can say is, sometime in the early 90s, it transitions into what is generally known and becomes the International Churches of Christ. So in 1989, world sector leaders are formed. They begin to, to divide up the world into sectors, into regions. And again, there is this wonderful global international focus of planting the church uh, in the entire world, right? Spreading the church to the entire world. Uh, Dr. Dara mentioned how basically the center of the movement moves from Boston to Los Angeles. The Los Angeles Church, uh, International Church, is planted in 1989, just a few months later because of the leaders who initially planted that church uh, having some difficulties. Kit McKean ends up moving his family to L.A. initially just to oversee a transition time, but eventually decides that they need to stay. And so they, um, again, shift the center, in a sense, from Boston to Los Angeles. And by 1992, Kit McKean is writing um, material where he, where he describes Los Angeles and his intention for Los Angeles as becoming a super church, right? What we would call maybe today a mega church in many ways. And this is part of what is already becoming a kind of a mega church movement in greater Christianity in the United States at this time. So, in this sense, the ICC is not different in the trends of what it's trying to imitate uh, elsewhere. Let me just cut in briefly. Of course. Before 2003, as I recall, some of you would know the numbers, I think the average attendance of an ICC church was about 500 which in other groups, other denominations, that would typically only be the top 3%. Very few would have the number, but for in most places, that was a pretty common number, 500 people. Yeah. Uh, we're skipping, obviously, a great deal of material here, but what happens um, soon, 1994, is they formalize this desire to, uh, to, to, to evangelize the entire world. The world sector leaders produce a document that they call the Evangelization Proclamation. We'll have a picture of it on the next slide or two slides here. The Evangelization Proclamation. They sign it all as though it is the Declaration of Independence or something like that, or the Emancipation yeah. Proclamation. Um, and what it is is a six year plan. The year 2000, I assume simply because it's a nice round number, uh, is, is kind of agreed upon as the goal. Well, they mistakenly thought the new millennium started that year. That they, they, they could have had a whole year years right. they realized it's going to 2001. Um, and, and so they choose the year 2000, so they come up with a six year plan to plant a church in every country that has a city of at least 100,000 people, which give or take, depending on how you do the numbers, is around 170 or so countries. And, um, and the idea, the principle behind all of this, is the idea that one of the mandates of the New Testament is to evangelize the world in a single generation. And the scripture that is often used to justify this is Colossians 1.23. Which, incidentally, as a New Testament scholar, Preach. difficult for me not to mention, Preach. doesn't say that. <laughs> and, it's, and it's very hard, really, to get that idea directly from Colossians 1.23. Amen. Nonetheless, this becomes something of the mantra of the movement, right? The disciple the world, evangelize the world in our generation, in one generation. And I think one way to describe, um, in many ways, why the ICUC falls apart is because of this unnecessarily abbreviated timeline in which they gave themselves to evangelize the world. Six years to plant a church in every nation of the world, which meant that as the date, as the deadline was approaching, people would be sent to some of the hardest countries in the world to evangelize who had very little experience with what they were doing. People who had been Christians sometimes for less than a year, right, would be sent to a, a Muslim country or a country that was very unfriendly to Christianity and be told, it is up to you to plant our church in this country or we fail this proclamation. And so the pressure was enormous. But Still, the Lord gave a lot of baptisms in this time of this concerted effort. And I was a bit mixed in my, I mean, I meet someone who I think, you know, really, your church shouldn't have been planted in this budget. Really? But if that's true, 
that you've not really become a Christian yourself, at least not, not through our help. Yeah. So it's, uh, you can see the hand of God in both ways. And, and that's why we try to emphasize as much as we can the strengths and the weaknesses here, right? There is, there is good and there is bad that is occurring. In the year 2000, is, uh, the ICC celebrates the completion of that goal, or at least we could say the, the technical completion of that goal. They do, by, by their own definition, in a sense, achieve the goal that they had stated, although several churches of those 170 may have one, two, three, four people total uh, in this church and, and are in either dire need to be replanted because they've already fallen apart or in dire need of further growth to really call them a church at all. Um, by this time, though, as you can see on the slide here, 42 churches have over 1,000 in attendance. 15 have over 3,000 in attendance. There are seven churches in the larger network of the ICC that have over 5,000 in attendance. And I can remember being in Los Angeles or in other places where conferences would be held where Kit McKean or somebody uh, would say something like, the ICOC is defining Christianity for this city or that city. The LA International Church of Christ is defining Christianity for Los Angeles. And, and that was the impression, and that was the goal. And most members were totally unaware that there were other Christians outside. This is the evangelization population. The friends are a bit small. You can find it online. A uh, quick assessment it's a grand vision. Uh, there's unsustainable growth, but uh, a grand vision. Uh, the growth rate is actually, the growth rate is in decline, even in the early 1990s, and there's a true crisis in retention, every bit as serious as the crisis of retention of the mainline Church of Christ that have been frequently been mentioned in an unfavorable way uh, from the 1970s on. Unity and uniformity were quite confused, and more and more criticism, not just from outside, but from inside the ICOC. By the mid to late 90s, many people were very unhappy, writing letters, have, having meetings, and a lot went on behind the scenes. And, and so that brings us to the transition, you could say, although we don't get there until really the end of this period and then into the next period that we'll talk about, of if what we're kind of calling ICOC 2.0. So there is growing unrest, right? There is earnest critique both, and has been outside the movement for quite a while, now earnest critique inside the movement as well. There were already attempts to reform early on in the 2000s. So for instance, uh, Gordon Ferguson and Wyndham Shaw put out a book called Global Rule Leadership that is all about consensus leadership, a model for how to lead a church. Uh, Wyndham Shaw and Gordon Ferguson at that time are, are elders in the Boston Church of Christ. This book is well received in certain churches, not well received in other churches, actually banned in some churches of the ICOC, which is kind of incredible. Um, and, and the idea here is to say we need to move away from a single person leading the church, we need to move away from kind of a harsh authoritarian way of leading the church and move towards a consensus model of leadership. Plurality. A plurality, where it is a group of people who are leading. Uh, it's at this same time or in this same year that Kip McKean steps down as the leader of the world sector leaders and therefore the leader of the international churches of Christ. Initially, he takes what is called a sabbatical, what they call, he calls a sabbatical. Within the following year, it becomes clear that he can no longer continue in his role as, as the leader of this movement. Uh, and so he resigns in a more official capacity. Um, even before this, the Boston Church of Christ, which, uh, of which I'm a member at the time, because I can remember this meeting, uh, issues a public apology. Uh, and, has, and has a meeting where, where the leaders apologize to the congregation, a congregation-wide meeting in 2002, where they apologize. Later that year, what, five or six thousand at that time? Yeah, but over, over 5,000 people in the Boston Church of Christ at this point. Um, that's right. Um, later that year, the World Sector Leaders meet in Long Beach, California, and um, depending on how you want to word this, they, they disband or they are disbanded. Um, they, they lose influence. The world sector leaders begin to resign or begin to realize that they need to do that. I would say they, they prefer to have autonomy, autonomy within their world sectors instead of being under one head, or one you know, corporate head. Yeah. Uh, and then one of the watershed moments 
uh, of the International Church of Christ history, which is one that I mentioned many of you, if you know the story, are familiar with, or at least have heard this term before. Uh, an evangelist in the London ICOC, Canadian, who's from Canada. Um, I don't know why that's be relevant. He's generally a member. Releases a letter initially to leaders, but eventually to the body as a whole. He releases it online, or it gets published uh, and made public online at the church website, at the ICOC website. So it's focused the first draft of the letter. Uncle notes for those of us who received it, he had BCC, he had blind copied other people who thought, well, I'm not going to get a second draft, I'm going to send this out. So it went viral before we even knew the word. <laughs> uh, he entitles this letter, Honest to God. And, and part of the reason that this is a, it's a long letter, 50 page, over 50 pages long, uh, part of the reason that this is such a watershed moment is because here is an, a leader on the inside who wants to continue and stay on the inside. is not leaving the ICOC, and yet who has issued a very grand and sweeping criticism of the practices, the authoritarian practices and, and other practices in the ICOC in a way that no leader up to that point had kind of dared to do, at least as publicly as Henry Creek does. Now, I think it's worth saying that if you go back, for instance, and look at Jerry Jones' material, uh, the elder whom I mentioned, who was part of the Boston movement for a while when I left, what, what Jerry Jones says is not very different than what Henry Creek says. But no one had been listening on the inside. And what Henry Creek manages to do somehow is to make people listen on the inside as well as those who are already been listening on the outside. And so this, in many ways, causes the ICOC to implode. They have open forums, they have town hall meetings, uh, many leaders, and some of you are, are present here who experienced this, um, many leaders are highly, um, I don't know what the right word would be, uh, criticized by, by their congregations for their practices. Um, a large majority of the paid staff of the International Churches of Christ within a year or two's time is no longer the staff numbered in the thousands before. Uh, by the end of this period, depending on how you want to draw the lines, at least 40,000 people leave the International Churches of Christ, which at that point is a 30% drop in membership. The height of the International Churches of Christ membership-wise is 135,000 people. 40,000 people leave. Some people had left in 2002. In some places, this wave of hit earlier. In some places, later. Okay, the DNA. Um, I think we can find a lot of this. On the positive side, the commitment, the evangelism, the, the innovation, the diversity, uh, even the compassion for the poor. Um, so many things that were great. And in most places, continue to be great. But one, what's been unhealthy, a form of discipling or mentoring that's too controlling. There's a way to be a mentor and a father and a mother and an uncle or an aunt, and there's a way not to do that. Putting uh, new Christians into leadership, uh, you know, the Bible says don't put a new neophyte into leadership, but that's probably talking about at a significant level. But it takes someone who's just, just graduated from high school and say, hey, you're in charge of 100 people. That's a dangerous thing, I think. We are non-existent eldership. There are only, I mean, fewer than 10 churches that even had elderships at the time of the six or seven hundred. And it was very hard to have elders. And I think this is a reaction against the pushback from elders in the mainline church in that period of the 60s and 70s, which was quite turbulent. Minimal biblical knowledge and lingo, which was used in some places and other places they never heard of it. But I remember visiting in South America and Europe and say, well, what about the OTC? What are you talking about? The one true church. Oh, that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses say. We're the one true church. No, that's what we've been taught. Oh my goodness. Or God's modern day movement as though there's no other movement. Enforce tithing and pressure, which Nick has mentioned already, to evangelize the world. In one generation, although at this time it was at least two generations into the movement, <laughs> so they actually they're coming up to their third generation. <laughs> they're still saying about doing one generation. Well, you know. 
right now, it, the movement, as I would define it, is 52 years old. Uh, we realize that we've come essentially to the end of our time, so I'm going to take advantage of you for one moment because I assume that you're probably staying for the second class. We'll extend over our time for just a minute. We'll give you a 15-minute break. And then, as I've said, our second class has far less material, and so we'll have, I think, a great deal of time for questions and answers in that class. So this is our last slide. So let me leave you with this, and then we'll release you for 15 minutes. But we, wanted, we wanted to end with this again, not because this is what we want to do, but because we wanted to make sure that we understand and acknowledge this. Uh, as I was preparing for this class, I received uh, actually quite a great piece of communication from people that I do not know. Uh, once this was advertised, telling me and, and warning me that, that the ICOC is, is a dangerous entity to be involved in. Um, and, and so I, I want to acknowledge that there are people who have been hurt, and there are people who are still hurt, and who are still processing and walking through what the crossroads and then the Boston movement and then the International Church of Christ uh, have done. There, there have been abusive practices, and these range from verbal to physical abuse to sexual abuse to, in particular, in many cases, leadership abuse. And we want to acknowledge that damage. It's important to acknowledge that. It is striking when you stop and look at the numbers and you realize that about 450,000 people were baptized into the, and let's just call it the International Churches of Christ, but from 1979 all the way up to 2002, about 450,000 people were baptized. Over 300,000 of those people left. So well over two-thirds, about 70% of the people who were baptized into the International Churches of Christ from 1979 to 2002 left the International Churches of Christ. That's significant. It is uh, more likely, you are more likely to run into a former member of the ICSC than you are to run into a current member, even in 2002. There is a great deal of disrespect, and we can say this on both sides, right, shown to other Christian groups uh, in the Churches of Christ, especially in the Churches of Christ, it's reciprocating this by far in the early days. And in our second class, we'll talk about the shared blame that occurs here. We don't want to minimize the role of the Church of Christ either. Uh, and then this one, I think, is particularly poignant. What really started, in many ways, as a reform movement within the Churches of Christ and could have been a very healthy reform movement was a campus ministries-driven movement saying to the, the people in the church, this church is beginning to die, and we have a way of, of reviving the again. Work with us here. What started as a reform movement became its own separate sect, you might say, not in the, um, in the sectarian sense, right? In the, um, in the anthropological sense of sect, right? It, it became a split off of its own. Of its own. And for a great deal of time, right, between the kind of late 90s to early 2000s, there was almost no communication whatsoever between the two groups. More often than not, and I experienced this firsthand many times, as you went to a uh, mainline Church of Christ website, there would often be a disclaimer somewhere at the bottom of the website that would say, in no way are we associated with the International Church of Christ. Right? And, and they felt the need to make that clear to anybody who might be interested. Right. Um, and so let's finally get to the period where we're ending this part of the session. In around 2002, the International Church of Christ enters into a serious period of reevaluation and redefinition. And that's where we will leave you for the next 15 minutes or so. We so. uh, dates. We talked about the DNA, and each movement, each group does have its own DNA. And then we looked at damage. Yeah. So we'll see you at uh, 3.15. 3.15, we'll re-begin. Part 2 of the report.